So the Iowa caucuses are over. We now move forward to New Hampshire. As I said yesterday on the show, it seems as though all of this is just a prolonged introduction to Donald Trump as the actual GOP nominee. He won Iowa by 30 points. He is presumably the front runner in New Hampshire. He's by far the front runner in South Carolina, according to the latest polling data. But New Hampshire is a little bit tight. According to the American Research Group poll, that is kind of a dicey poll. It's got a C plus rating from 5 to 38. But according to that poll, the latest presidential poll has Donald Trump and Nikki Haley tied at 40%, with 9% undecided. Ron DeSantis clocking in at 4%. Vivek Ramaswamy, who dropped out at 4%. Presumably, those 4% from Ramaswamy will now move over to Donald Trump. In fact, Vivek last night went on stage with Donald Trump. He, of course, dropped out right after the Iowa caucuses and endorsed Trump, which, of course, was going to happen from pretty much the very beginning of the race. Again, Vivek's race was about things other than being president of the United States. He accomplished many of those goals, but this was sort of what was expected. Here was Vivek last night on stage with Donald Trump. Last night, I was honored to receive the endorsement of a man who has become a true leader and earned the admiration of so many patriots. I, I've been a friend of his, even though we were competing against each other. But I was a friend of his, and we got along. And he was saying he's a great president. I kept saying, why is he running? He keeps calling me a great president. <laughs> But he's a fantastic guy, a very smart guy. He's got some tremendous ideas, and uh, he's young, and he's got some young ideas, too, and that's a good thing. So he has a big, beautiful, bright future ahead, Vivek Ramaswamy. Come on up, Vivek. Now they're best friends again after Trump shivved him right in the guts last week. Let's do this, guys. I do love that. Um, I do love that aside there. I don't even know why he's running since he loves me. <laughs> yeah, that, that really was the question. Was it not? Vivek then came out and then he talked about how Donald Trump stood for the true principles of the Republican Party, which I am serious. He said revolved around not cutting any entitlement program, but cutting aid to Ukraine. Which, again, you can make arguments about cutting aid to Ukraine, not cutting aid to Ukraine. But the idea that the Republican Party wholesale is behind non-reform and non-touching of the entitlements, it is one of the reasons why Donald Trump was more popular with the general electorate than some other Republicans. But it is not a particularly conservative principle. Also, the idea that any amount of money spent on Ukraine would have healed the problems with Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid is absurd. The entire amount of U.S. aid to Ukraine so far, which is $75 billion, a lot of military aid, and civilian aid to Ukraine. That would pay for about 11 days worth of Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. But put all of that aside, the bottom line is that the dynamics of the race are obviously very much in Donald Trump's favor. There will be apparently no debates next week. Nikki Haley suggested that she would not debate Ron DeSantis, who finished ahead of her in the Iowa caucuses. The reason she's doing that is she is now playing Trump's card. Trump's card was, I am not going to debate anyone because I'm so far ahead. Nikki Haley is basically suggesting that going into New Hampshire, she's so far ahead of DeSantis that there is no reason to make herself vulnerable to that. ABC News then duly called off the Republican primary debate. They announced that there would be no debate at all. They said our intent was to host a debate coming out of the Iowa caucuses. But we always knew that would be contingent on the candidates and the outcome of the race. While, while our robust election coverage will continue, ABC News and WMUR-TV will not be moving forward with Thursday's Republican presidential primary debate in New Hampshire. Now, again, do I think that New Hampshire is quite as close to that poll as making out? I don't. I think that Donald Trump does, in fact, have the upper hand in New Hampshire, even should Nikki Haley pull out some sort of upset win in New Hampshire. They would then head down to South Carolina, where Donald Trump does have a fairly substantial lead in that particular race. Remember that New Hampshire was a place where Chris Christie was pulling in the double digits until he dropped out. Presumably, a lot of that support is going to flow over to Nikki Haley. But let's be real about this. All eyes are already turning to the general election. And because all eyes are turning to the general election, that means we have to look at the strategy that Democrats are using to defeat Donald Trump. Well, to understand that strategy, you really have to speculate on whether this is all, as Admiral Akbar might say, a trap. Whether, in fact, Democrats' plan was to basically get Republicans to nominate Donald Trump so that they could run against him. Of course, they tried this trap in 2015, 2016. Hillary Clinton suggested that Donald Trump run. She wanted Donald Trump to be the Republican nominee. And then, of course, she lost it to him. Are Democrats repeating history? Andy McCarthy at National Review suggests that that's the case because he says that basically by promoting all of these legal cases against Donald Trump this year, that opened up the primary in favor of Donald Trump. 
They reversed all of the momentum in the race in favor of Donald Trump because the Republicans reacted to the unjust persecution of Trump by supporting him in the race. And then the entire next year is going to be all about his legal cases. And in fact, there's some data to support this. If you look at the Republican presidential primary polling, what you see is that right after the 2022 elections, Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis were running basically neck and neck. And then it continued to run neck and neck through January, through February, and then something happened in March. What happened in March? The announcement of prosecutions against Donald Trump. Once that happened, the polls opened up wide. The dam burst and Republicans moved behind Donald Trump because they perceived that Donald Trump was being unduly persecuted. And Donald Trump's line, which was effectively that they are coming after me because they will also come after you, was an effective line. That's particularly effective when the Democratic Party is making clear that the center of all of its policies lies equity, equity, equity. And when many Americans hear equity, what they mean is the preferred Democratic voting constituencies are going to get special benefits and everybody else is going to get jacked. So when Donald Trump says they're coming after me because they're also coming after you, that does have some credibility to it. That said, the next year obviously is going to be a very stacked year for Donald Trump in terms of the various calendars. We'll get to more on this in just one second. First, as you've already seen, 2024 is going to be a wild ride. You're already seeing the impacts of inflation at the gas pump, the grocery store. The dollar is losing its buying power faster than wages can increase. So let me ask you a question. How are you protecting your savings? Consider diversifying with gold from Birch Gold Group. For decades, gold has been the choice of investors and central banks to hedge against inflation. I've invested in precious metals before. I've diversified. It's a smart thing to do because, again, diversification, good strategy against the terrible possibility of future events. Birch Gold can help you create a well-thought-out and balanced investment strategy. They'll help you convert an existing IRA or 401k into an IRA in gold without paying a penny out of pocket this month only. When you open that gold IRA with Birch Gold, you will get a free signed copy of my book, The Authoritarian Moment. But you need to text Ben to 989898 to qualify. Birch Gold has been the exclusive gold company of The Daily Wire for the past seven years. I buy my gold from them, and you can too. Text Ben to 989898. Protect your savings. Claim your eligibility for a free signed copy of The Authoritarian Moment. So here is where we stand in terms of the calendar, the judicial calendar. So on January 8th, arguments in Washington Federal Appeals Court over Trump's claim to absolute immunity happened. That's already happened. On January 10th, the Trump Organization civil fraud charges closing arguments were made. Today, there was a second trial that began in New York in which E. Jean Carroll, a woman who alleged that Donald Trump raped her in a department store in New York City. Again, allegations that I think are really dicey on their face, but she did win a defamation suit against him. And now she's filed a second defamation suit against him. Next week, January 23rd, of course, you have the New Hampshire primary. On February 8th, you have a Supreme Court case with oral arguments hearing about whether Donald Trump should be barred from the ballot. On February 12th, we're down at Mar-a-Lago and there's a hearing in Fort Pierce, Florida on which classified materials the special counsel can withhold from the Trump defense or not withhold from the Trump defense. Three days later, there's a hearing in Manhattan on the Stormy Daniels hush money case. That'd be the Alvin Bragg, again, specious Manhattan DA case. Move forward just a little bit in time. And you end up with the March 4th scheduled opening in Washington of Trump's trial on the four felony charges being brought by Jack Smith with regard to January 6th. Move forward just a little more in time. March 25th, you have state criminal cases. Stormy Daniels again on the docket. That's the scheduled start of the Trump trial over the hush money that was paid to Stormy Daniels to cover up their affair. In May, you have the Mar-a-Lago classified documents trial, which is scheduled to start. Now, again, all of these dates may be delayed. August 5th, you have the Georgia Rico case that is supposed to start. Okay, so this is going to be all year long. It's going to be all year long. Now, that obviously means that there's going to be a lot of this in the headlines, and that could theoretically hurt Donald Trump. Or, or it is also possible that Donald Trump ranting about legal cases actually means that it gets kind of boring. See, the thing is, with Donald Trump, you know, when Donald Trump talks about a topic too much, it basically turns into tinnitus. And for those who don't know about tinnitus, tinnitus is when you have ringing in your ears. And it really is irritating. Right? You wake up in the middle of the night, you hear the ringing in your ears. And what your brain does at a certain point is it just kind of tunes it out. In the same way that you have now tuned out the insane overestimation of the media of Donald Trump's supposed fascism. You've tuned it out now, right? It just became part of the background noise. In the same exact way, Donald Trump ranting on Truth Social about his judicial cases, I think that that's now part of the background noise for most Americans. I don't think most Americans care particularly much about all of this. 
I think most Americans are already like, okay, so you went after him on a thousand different things. None of them seem to be particularly noteworthy or crazy. We all remember January 6th, so that already was baked into the cake. Donald Trump and women? Well, that's been a thing since, you know, the 1980s. So Donald Trump ranting on Truth Social really doesn't make that big of a difference. And here is where, as I said yesterday, the fact that Donald Trump is on Truth Social is ironically actually a great help to him. If Donald Trump were on Twitter ranting about things, you know that every tweet that he sent would get hundreds of millions of views. That is not an exaggeration. I mean, the, the Donald Trump on Twitter currently has, I kid you not, 87.4 million followers. 87.4 million on Truth Social, he's posting things and he's getting like 13,000 likes on things. Okay, meaning no one's seeing the stuff that he's ranting, which is actually quite good for him because it means that we can just filter all of it out. So, for example, he was ranting about E. Jean Carroll on Truth Social yesterday. He said, after a historic win in Iowa, I'm going to the Biden-encouraged witch hunt in lower Manhattan to fight against a fake case from a woman I've never met, seen, or touched. Celebrity lines don't count. Naturally, it starts right after Iowa and during the very important New Hampshire primary where, despite their sinister attempts, I will be tonight. It is a giant election interference scam pushed and financed by political operatives. I had no idea who this woman was. Pure fiction. Now, that may very well be true. I mean, it is certainly true that E. Jean Carroll's case was funded, in fact, by a Democrat billionaire named Reed Hoffman, who's a tech bro. That is certainly true. But the bottom line is this. Democrats are gambling that Trump's legal foibles are going to somehow sink his campaign. I don't know that that's a particularly amazing gamble. Nonetheless, the media are very into it. Maggie Haberman and Jonathan Carl, they say that Trump's campaign is going to get stuck in the courtroom. But Maggie, one of the things he wants to do is to drag it out is because he's got this very complex legal and campaign schedule over the coming months. But he likes to appear in court because it's good for fundraising, uh, shockingly, but it is. Um, how, what is the thinking here inside? Like, let's let's use this as a continual Trump's in the news. Is it a good thing to be in the news for? Uh, he's decided that, you know, he's going to try to turn this into a positive as much as possible for the reasons you said. It has a strong fundraising effect with his base. It has a galvanizing, you know, victimhood effect with his base. Uh, I also think, Karen, I've been thinking about this a lot for the last couple of days. I, I think he prefers this to the act of campaigning. It blocks out attention that his rivals can get. I think that he has decided he is going to turn what are objectively undesirable circumstances into as much of a positive as he can. And, and this is a campaign that is indis it's indistinguishable from his uh, from his legal cases. I Correct. Mean, and, and it's very they're much being run by the. I mean, they're, they're they're all involved. I mean, you know, his 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 political advisors are. Uh, you know, as aware and involved in in what is happening on the legal front as anything else. It's, it's and, and, and he spends more time with his lawyers, with his legal team, than he does with his political team. Right. But 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 even when he's with the political team, as Maggie points out, it's 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 about the the lawyers. Okay, well, I mean, all of that again may very well be true. But are you that interested in this stuff? I don't find myself particularly stimulated by Donald Trump's legal cases. Again, all of it happened like before. And it's not as though the trials themselves are going to be wildly fascinating. You're not watching a murder trial here. You're going to be watching a bunch of people testify about the handling of classified documents down in Florida or people rehashing for the one millionth time what happened on January 6th up in Washington, D.C. Or more allegations about Stormy Daniels and campaign payments from full on eight years ago. Is that something that's really going to hurt Donald Trump? Which means the Democrats are now having to rely on some backup strategies. One of those backup strategies is, of course, the attempt to bar Donald Trump from the ballot. Yesterday, Joe Biden campaign co-chair Jeffrey Katzenberg suggested he didn't know if it was undemocratic to ban Donald Trump from the ballot. I mean, I do. It's undemocratic. You can't just ban your political opponents from the ballot. Jeffrey, you said that voters will decide the election. Does the campaign feel it's undemocratic for a presidential candidate to be kept off the ballot? I don't know. I've, yeah. I'll please. take that. <laughs> The Supreme Court's going to decide that. Uh, that's not something that's not a, a, a Democratic Party position. Uh, it's just that in various states, people, individuals, uh, have taken this uh, issue up, and, and we're going to hear from the Supreme Court shortly, I'm sure. Okay, so again, the fact that they are lending credibility to this nonsense is really not going to benefit them, and it does lend credence to Donald Trump's claims that they are out to get him, which, of course, is the reason he got the nomination in the first place, presuming that he wraps it up, as I assume that he will. There's more on this in just one second. First, I've been talking about my Helix mattress for years. I've had my Helix mattress for nearly a decade at this point. It is the gift that keeps on giving because it is made just for me. I took that two-minute sleep quiz. It matched me to a bed personalized for my taste. 
You should have a bed that's made for you. Helix is now introducing their newest, most high-end collection, Helix Elite. Helix Elite harnesses years of extensive mattress expertise to offer a truly elevated sleep experience. The Helix Elite collection includes six different mattress models, each tailored for specific sleep positions and firmness preferences. Go to helixsleep.com slash Ben. Check out the new collection today. If you're nervous about buying a mattress online, well, you don't have to be. Helix has a sleep quiz that matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress because why would you buy a mattress made for somebody else? I took that Helix quiz. As I say, I was matched with a mattress that works for me. Go to helixsleep.com slash Ben. Take that two-minute sleep quiz yourself. Find the perfect mattress for your sleep and body type. Right now, they have a special deal just for you. Helix is offering 25% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Start the year off right. Upgrade your sleep at helixsleep.com slash Ben. It's their best offer yet. It's not going to last long. That's helixsleep.com slash Ben. With Helix, better sleep starts right now. Meanwhile, another tack the Democrats are trying to take preemptively is the same tack they took in 2020. And we talk about the rigging of the 2020 election, right? The difference between rigging and just outright fraud, is that rigging is about changing the circumstances surrounding the election in not illegal ways, but ways that obviously are meant to change the direction of the outcome in immoral ways. So for example, changing the balloting process might not be illegal. In Pennsylvania, I think it probably was illegal, but you know, fulfilled certain legal criteria, but was obviously meant to skew the result in a particular way. So allowing people to vote early by mail three months in advance of elections leading to 60% of all Democrat votes in 2020 being cast by mail. That obviously is an act of rigging. That is why it was done. The attempt by the FBI, which this again may have been illegal, to interfere in the election by effectively telling all of these big tech companies that they ought not report or allow reporting on Hunter Biden's laptop in the month before the election. That obviously had a major impact on the election. Now, the reason I distinguish that sort of rigging from outright fraud is outright fraud is we are going to bus in tons of fake ballots and we are going to shove them through the machines three, four, or five times. Or we're going to take just big vats of Trump votes and throw them in the river and they're never seen again. That sort of stuff does happen in American politics, but not to the extent of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of votes lost or, or spoiled. But does that mean that the 2020 election wasn't quote unquote rigged in a sort of informal sense? Of course not. It was rigged in the informal sense in which the media obviously were on board. All the American institutions were on board with Joe Biden's victory. And we're starting to see it right now in some of the most perverse ways. A couple of those most perverse ways are members of the intelligence community who were awful during the 2020 election. You'll recall that when the Hunter Biden laptop story came down, there were dozens and dozens of intelligence officials who claimed that Hunter Biden's laptop was, in fact, a piece of Russian disinformation. That was election rigging. Was it illegal for them to claim that? No. Was it them using their credibility that the American people took seriously in order to pretty much openly lie about Hunter Biden's laptop? Absolutely. Well, now you're having the same thing. You're going to have intelligence officials, foreign and domestic, claiming that Donald Trump is actually a threat to the good working order of the West. This presumably is why you have the former MI6 head, Sir Richard Dearlove, talking about Trump's re-election being an actual national security risk to the UK. But I think it's important, but I'm not a politician. You have to add a political threat, which I'm worried about, which is uh, Trump's I thought that I, re-election, I, which I, I think for the UK's national security is problematic because if Trump, as it were, acts hastily and damages the Atlantic Alliance, uh, that is a big deal for the UK. We've put all our eggs in defense terms in the NATO basket. Okay, but the reality is that even when Donald Trump was president, he was just asking for our NATO partners to increase their spending. The reason I point this out is because if the intelligence community is in fact mobilized against Donald Trump, they can do some pretty corrupt and terrible things. Meanwhile, members of the big tech community are also mobilizing over the Beginning of the week, we have had the beginning of the World Economic Forum over in Davos. So for folks who don't know the World Economic Forum, it was founded originally by a guy named Klaus Schwab in the 1970s. It is essentially a meeting of big business leaders, big corporate leaders, big government leaders. They all get together and they plan. They plan for what the world should look like. They all coordinate with one another. In fact, we have a brand new facts episode out on YouTube where I explain everything you need to know about the WEF and Davos in detail. And basically, their agenda is cooperation in corporatist, quasi-fascistic fashion between big business, big government, big tech, in order to sort of rig the rules of the road. And already over at the WEF 2024, participants are talking about the necessity for quote-unquote policing misinformation. Now, nobody's interested in falsehood being prevaricated. But what I think everybody is interested in is who gets to set the standards. 
And to say that I don't trust the people at the WF to determine what is misinformation and what is not is to put it absolutely mildly. Here, for example, are Harvard professor Naomi Oreskes and Center for Democracy's Reeve Givens talking about the necessity of policing misinformation over at Davos. Again, these are when people talk about globalists, this is what they really mean. They don't just mean they, they really don't mean people who are in favor of free trade. Most Republicans are in favor of free trade, including for the most part Donald Trump, despite his rhetoric. When he was actually president, he was a pretty free trading president. When people say globalists, what they mean is a cadre of people who wish to restructure the entire global system so that they are in control of the levers of power. And that's what it looks like over at the WEF, including with regard to, quote unquote, misinformation. We'll get to more on this in just one second. First, according to Forbes, January is the hottest month for hiring. Business owners, hiring managers, they're on the hunt for top talent. That's not an easy thing to do. If you're currently hiring, you can probably relate. It's challenging to find qualified candidates. That's why you need ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter's powerful matching technology finds the right people for your roles fast. And right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. Immediately after you post your job, ZipRecruiter's smart technology starts showing you candidates whose skills and experience match it. To encourage top candidates to respond to your job post even sooner, ZipRecruiter lets you send them a personal invite to apply. As a rate candidate, ZipRecruiter sends you more of the ones you like from the thousands of new job seekers who join the site. This month, find all the talent you need to fill all of your roles with ZipRecruiter. See for yourself why four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within day one. Just go to this exclusive web address right now. Try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash D-A-I-L-Y-W-I-R-E. We here at Daily Wire have been using the ZipRecruiter for years. It's where we found half our employees. They're great. They're going to help your business too. Go check them out right now at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. So here are two panelists over at the WEF talking about the necessity for cracking down on misinformation, by which they mean information they don't want you to hear. And the rest of the private sector... It's just sitting on the sidelines and they're just not saying anything and they're biting their tongue because, well, maybe they liked President Trump for other reasons because he cut corporate taxes. Mm -hmm. And so I think the private sector has largely stood by and allowed a lot of really damaging things to happen, things that in the long run will not be good for, you know, liberal democratic capitalism. And so I really hope that the World Economic Forum will take this issue on board and think harder about the role that the private sector can play in standing up against disinformation. In this big election year, what kinds of safeguards and measures are you thinking that companies and countries should be trying to implement as they get ready for elections? Sure. Well, I'll pick up on a theme that I think you were just getting to, which is one of the most crucial intervention points is how we surface authentic, trusted sources of information. And you're absolutely right that the media has a critical role in this. Some of the tech companies do. If you're a search engine or a social media platform, I think it is your duty to help surface the trusted sources of information. Okay, again, who's going to pick those trusted sources of information? Presumably that will be the New York Times, the Washington Post, all the left-wing outlets that the left, particularly the globalist left, absolutely loves. When we talk about rigging the election, this is what we are talking about. And it is Joe Biden's team who's working hand in glove with these people. John Kerry, who's sort of the official envoy to the WEF every single year, he obviously is is very much in favor of a globalized regime in which he gets to ferry back and forth and make friends with the Chinese and talk, for example, about the wonders of restructuring their entire global economy so as to avoid climate change. Of course, he takes private jets doing all of this. Here he was at Davos talking about the need to transition away from fossil fuels. In, in Dubai, uh, we were able uh, to change that paradigm to some degree with one critical paragraph. And that paragraph is that we must transition away from fossil fuels. Remember, we could not get a resolution between phase out, phase down in Glasgow. And there was no mention of this in Paris. But in Dubai... 195 countries, including oil producing, oil gas producing countries, came to consensus that we must say to the world that we must transition away from fossil fuels. Okay, this guy is now moving from the Joe Biden White House to the Joe Biden campaign. And when we talk about globalist rigging of elections, we are talking about people like this. And here's John Kerry announcing that he's joining the campaign. I know, striking fear into the hearts of Republicans everywhere, given the fact that he lost to George W. Bush in 2004. I am hatched. In other words, by under law of the hatch law in our country, 
because I'm a federal employee, I'm not allowed to engage in the, in the, in the campaign. That's not going to happen. So I, I want to be able to speak out on that and other issues globally, but I'm going to stay at this. Uh, and, and there are so many different ways to continue to be able to be engaged in this. And I think the American public, this is going to be one of the reasons I want my voice back to be able to go out and get involved is this issue is a voting issue. And, and people ought to go to the polls because they want to continue down this road and see this new economy emerge and not have air that kills them and gives them diseases and sends their kids to the hospital in the summer from environmentally induced God, He is so tiresome. But it, it is the WF Davos crowd that does not want Donald Trump. That is who this is. And again, their entire shtick is working together. It's collusion between government and big business. And big tech. That is the entire shtick at the WEF. It is this, this is the Joe Biden campaign in a nutshell. Add on a patina of intersectionality and equity talk, and that is the Joe Biden campaign. Here, for example, is the WF president, a guy named Boris Brenda, talking about collaboration between business and government. The World Economic Forum's annual meeting, I think, is the proof of that. The week ahead and the year ahead will deliver important outcomes of collaboration between business and he then went ahead and explained how this requires a new world order. Again, I, it is amazing how they just stumble headlong into saying the words, but here we go. That order seems to know, know, uh, not be uh, the order anymore. We are on the way to a new order, so we are between orders. Uh, do you agree with that, or are there ways of uh, what are we able to keep on the positive side from the old order to bring into a new world order? And how can we avoid that that new world order uh, becomes like a jungle growing back and we rather uh, have an order based on international law and the principles that have brought us prosperity and uh, freedom uh, for decades? I don't think the international order built after 1945 is getting replaced wholesale with some new order. Um, it will obviously evolve as it, as it has evolved multiple times over the decades since 1945. But I do think in a, in a more sharp and distinctive way, we are moving into a new era. And that's what I talked about in my remarks. And okay, that, of course, is the NSA, Jake Sullivan. So when we talk about Joe Biden being in the pocket of sort of these types of people, and in fact, this kind of Borg all acting together, that is correct. This is what stands in the way of Donald Trump attaining the White House again. Folks, last year, because of you, Preborn's network of clinics saw over 58,000 babies' lives saved. Thank you to all of you who made that possible. Let's celebrate these precious babies. I was just kind of like, Lord, if this is, you know, if this is the way, you know, let me know. If this is not the way, give me a sign, you know, before I walk through these doors. And I was, as I was getting ready to walk up the steps and touch the doorknob, you know, a guardian angel. And he just told me, he was like, baby, you don't have to go in there. And he was like, I know someone that can help him. Just to see the development of a baby that small, and I say baby because, I mean, he had little arms and legs, and <laughs> I mean, you know, it was actually a, a human, you know, and to see that and to have that physical and that contact once you look at that, I think it just pulls on your heart a little. <laughs> Each of these babies are truly miraculous, and every day, Preborn celebrates 200 miracles. For just 28 bucks a month, you can help sponsor an ultrasound and help save a life. When a mom sees her baby on ultrasound and hears his heartbeat, it can be a divine connection that doubles a baby's chance at life. Let's join together and help moms choose life. Just dial pound 250, say keyword baby. That's pound 250 baby. Or visit preborn.com slash Ben. That's preborn.com slash Ben. Ultrasounds are basically a magical technology. Obviously, we have four kids. We met all four of our kids long before they were born. When a mom is thinking about whether or not to keep her baby and she finally sees a picture of her baby in the womb, it changes everything about her life. Visit preborn.com slash Ben to make such ultrasounds available. That's preborn.com slash Ben. I mean, the, the thing in favor of Donald Trump is, of course, the fact that the Biden administration and these globalists are truly incompetent at all of this. In fact, the title of the WF this, this year is Restoring Trust. Well, I mean, they, the, the trust hasn't been lost because people are talking about them. The trust has been lost because they are garbage at this. It turns out that all the people who suggest you ought to give them control over your life and over the system, those people have botched it six ways from Sunday. And that is Donald Trump's opening. And speaking of that opening and the botchery, what's going on on the border continues to be a complete disaster area. 
an amazing story between Texas and the federal government. According to Breitbart.com, a strongly worded letter from the Department of Homeland Security to the state of Texas is demanding access to the U.S.-Mexico border on land seized by the state in Eagle Pass. Eagle Pass, of course, is one of the great sources of illegal immigration in the country. Right now, hundreds of thousands of people every month arriving at Eagle Pass, DHS officials ordered the state to cease and desist its efforts to block Border Patrol's access in and around Shelby Park and remove all barriers to access by the end of the day on January 17th. The DHS General Counsel, Jonathan Meyer, wrote in a letter to Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, Texas's actions are clearly unconstitutional and are actively disrupting the federal government's operations. Why? What is Texas doing? Well, they set up actual barriers to prevent people from crossing the border. DHS wants to dismantle those barriers so they can continue to essentially treat Border Patrol as a ferry service for illegal immigrants. As I've mentioned, I was just down at the border. We're going to have a bunch of material coming out about that. And it is truly amazing. Joe Biden has essentially turned our Border Patrol units into a busing service for illegal immigrants. They literally arrive at the border, hold up their hands, say they're claiming asylum. Border Patrol then picks them up, processes them, lets them into the country within 72 hours. The state of Texas is saying no, and they are building barriers. And this means the Biden administration is now probably going to take them to court. They say, quote, the recent actions by the state of Texas have impeded operations of the Border Patrol. Now, as Breitbart points out, the use of the word impeded by the DHS general counsel could imply a threat of criminal action against officers and agents of the state of Texas who are carrying out the orders of Governor Abbott to secure Shelby Park and prevent Border Patrol's entry to the area. Now, again, the reason they don't want the Border Patrol in there is because the Border Patrol is simply facilitating the entry of all of the illegal immigrants. All of this is coming amidst a false story reported widely by the left wing media suggesting that the state of Texas is responsible for migrant drownings. According to a timeline provided by the Texas Military Department on Sunday, the Border Patrol's request to enter the park came after migrant drownings had already occurred and the bodies of the families were being pulled from the water by Mexican authorities. But that didn't stop the media from running with the story, which was supposedly that a bunch of migrants were trying to cross the border. They had started to drown. Border Patrol wanted to get in and help them, and Texas had stopped them. This is reported by CBS News. It was false. It wasn't true. It turns out that the migrants had already drowned by the time Border Patrol was even aware of it and arrived on the border. DHS continues to pretend that this contributed to migrant drownings. Meyer said, quote, on January 12th, after learning from Grupo Beta, a group affiliated with the National Institute of Migration of Mexico, that a group of migrants was attempting to cross the river, Border Patrol contacted Texas officials and requested access to the border, and Texas refused. Later, a rescue team from Mexico was able to rescue two individuals from the group, both with signs of hypothermia. Three individuals drowned. Texas has demonstrated that even in the most exigent circumstances, it will not allow Border Patrol access to the border to conduct law enforcement and emergency response activities. And that, of course, is false. That is not true. It turns out that these people, unfortunately, had drowned long before Border Patrol was even aware of the situation at all. But Joe Biden is receiving pressure from his left flank for the global regime of immigration to continue. Open migration, free flow of people across borders, including the American border. There is a piece today in The New York Times from a person named Andrea Flores, who's an immigration policy advisor for both Obama and Biden, calling on Joe Biden not to compromise with the Republicans on border policy. She says, quote, Mr. Biden could lose key powers that presidents have used for decades to regulate immigration in times of crisis. Worse, if Mr. Trump is reelected, he'll have new tools at his disposal. He could use to terrorize immigrants and make the chaos at the border even more acute. She says, for example, quote, take the reported expulsion authority Senate negotiators are considering. That policy would allow border officials to expel migrants without asylum screenings. That may be, appear to be an effective deterrence measure, but similar asylum restrictions have proved otherwise. That, of course, is false. Title 42, which is what we were using in order to just get people off the border, it was highly successful in preventing more people from crossing the border illegally. Instead, she is claiming that we should incentivize people to seek asylum at our ports of entry and expedite asylum claims. So we should widen the nozzle to allow more illegal immigrants into the country. This, of course, is a lady who was, in fact, an advisor to Joe Biden on immigration policy. Now, Joe Biden's bad governance is going to have significant ramifications for his own reelect hopes. In just one second, we'll get to exactly what that means in terms of the Middle East, because there is a story that has been wildly underreported that we must get to here because it is insane that, again, it is not top of the news. We'll get to that in just one moment. First, guys, this is a no brainer. If you want to protect your kids from leftist indoctrination rampant in mainstream media, we have the way to do it. Start a 14 day free trial to Bent Key. It's the new kids entertainment app from The Daily Wire. Bent Key is the only streaming app that offers high quality, family friendly shows that reflect your values. Bent Key features amazing characters, timeless stories that will spark your kids' imagination and curiosity with hundreds of episodes your kids will love and you can trust with new episodes streaming every Saturday morning. 
How do I know Ben Key's good? Well, not just because we made it, but also because I let my kids watch it. And believe you me, I would not let my kids watch anything I did not personally approve of. You can try Ben Key for free for 14 days. No catch, no gimmick, no hidden fees. Just awesome content your kids will love and you can trust. All you have to do is use code UNLOCK at BenKey.com. You will get 14 days of unlimited access to Ben Key's world of adventure. Go to BenKey.com. Use code UNLOCK at sign up to start your trial today. Meanwhile, the disaster that is rolling in the Middle East is of Joe Biden's making. A couple stories that are just insane in the last 24 hours. So first, did you know that we have two missing U.S. Navy SEALs? Were you aware of this? You weren't? Why wasn't that top of the news? Typically, when we lose American soldiers, that's pretty big news. When you have two U.S. Navy SEALs who just go missing, that's also usually pretty big news. Why is it not big news? Well, because Joe Biden is the president of the United States. It's not that it's not been covered. It's that it's just not big news. ABC News says the two U.S. Navy SEALs missing in the Gulf of Aden off Somalia were on a mission to board a Dow that led to the seizure of Iranian-made ballistic and cruise missile components headed to the Houthis. The risky nighttime mission last Thursday to board the Dow in rough waters continued even after one of the Navy SEALs fell in the water and the second Navy SEAL following protocol jumped into the water to rescue his teammate. Search and rescue operations for the two missing SEALs are continuing in the Gulf of Aden with U.S. Navy aircraft and ships participating in the search. For years, the U.S. Navy has intercepted these Dows, that's a small fishing or cargo vessel from the region, believed to be carrying Iranian-made weapons to the Houthis. Typically, boarding teams pull aside these ships to undertake a flag verification mission if the Dow is unflagged or has replaced its flag to mask their smuggling mission. The latest seizure was the first since the Houthis began to carry out the more than 30 drone and missile attacks on commercial shipping in the Red Sea. So apparently, these Navy SEALs are unfortunately missing. It's hard to imagine that given the fact they've been missing now for days on end, that they probably are dead. According to the Pentagon, in the wintertime, the sea state is typically 8 to 12 feet. The horizon is flat, so 8 to 12 feet is 8 feet above the flat horizon, then 8 foot is like a 16-foot wave. Meanwhile, Iran continues to facilitate terror around the region, not just with regard to Israel, not even just with regard to the Red Sea. I mean, they are doing that in the Red Sea, by the way. Right now, the latest is that the Yemeni Houthis continue to attack, apparently, shipping in the Red Sea. Tuesday's strike on the Iranian-linked Houthi movement in Yemen was another attack the U.S. had to launch against the Houthis in Yemen. It targeted four sites where rebels were preparing to launch missiles against commercial shipping vessels. And the Biden administration, which has been signaling that it is going to do what it must do in order to ensure shipping in this region, now they're relegated to saying, well, you know, we, we fit, we're doing these low-level attacks and we figure the Houthis are going to continue. I have a question. So what is it exactly precisely that you think you are doing? Here is Jake Sullivan explaining, well, you know, we figured the Houthis wouldn't stop. He's saying this at Davos. We mobilized a coalition of countries to take strikes to degrade the Houthis' capabilities so their ability to mount uh, sustained and complex attacks uh, becomes more difficult over time. Uh, but... We did not say when we launched our attacks, they're going to end once and for all. The Houthis will be fully deterred. We anticipated the Houthis would continue to try to hold this critical artery at risk. And we continue to reserve the right to take further action. But this needs to be an all hands on deck effort. OK, did, did I, I missed the part where he laid out a plan. So his idea was we're going to bomb a few empty sites after a week of warning and then they will continue to come after the shipping. And then what? And then what? I mean, right now, everybody's routing around the Red Sea. It is a critical shipping artery. What are you going to do about it? If your solution is, we'll fire a few rockets at you and you fire a few rockets at us, and, uh, and that's pretty much status quo, how exactly is that a solution? The answer is it is not. And if you like higher prices at the grocery store, prepare for some of those. John Kirby, spokesman with the White House National Security Council, said on Tuesday that when the United States launched dozens of strikes in Yemen last week, senior U.S. officials fully anticipated the Houthis would probably conduct some retaliatory strikes. He said, we're not looking to expand this. They still have time to make the right choice, which is to stop these reckless attacks. But you have not made clear what exactly the consequences will be if they do not do that. And again, if you are the Houthis, all you have to do is survive this. So here's John Kirby trying to explain what the hell we're doing. Strikes that we took Friday no matter what the Houthis might say, it has nothing to do with the fight in Gaza. It has to do with defending shipping in the Red Sea. Uh, no matter what the Houthis say, uh, they're not going after ships that are tied to Israel. Um, you know, they hit yesterday the other day, they hit a ship carrying Russian oil. It was Panamanian flag. Nothing to do with Israel. So I, sh I, don't, I think we need to not buy into the Houthi propaganda. That's one. Uh, we still have an interest in not seeing this conflict widen or escalate. In fact, that's why we took those strikes uh, on Friday to degrade Houthi capability so that it 
so that it can't widen and escalate. I'm, I'm so confused. So you don't want it to widen and escalate. So you're doing just enough so that they continue to harass shipping in the Middle East, thus prolonging the possibility of this thing widening and escalating. Meanwhile, Joe Biden quietly attempting to walk back his idiotic policy from 2021, in which he delisted the Houthis as a terror group, according to Jackie Heinrich, who is reporting for Fox News. His sources tell Fox the Biden administration is expected to redesignate the Houthis as a terrorist organization. Officials have not yet said if the group will be placed under the same designation, but sources tell Fox there are a number of sanctions options that can be used in lieu of a formal FTO finding, which can take a long time to complete. So, again, they are now having to walk back their dumbass policy with regard to Iran in the same way they earlier in the administration had to walk back their dumbass policy with regard to the Saudis. Meanwhile, the Iranians, by the way, are now attacking targets in Pakistan. So if you think that this regime isn't attempting to destabilize anything within rocket range, you are totally wrong. According to Reuters, Pakistan said neighboring Iran has now violated its airspace, resulting in the death of two children hours after Iranian state media said missiles targeted two bases of militant group Yaish al-Adil on Tuesday. Islamabad warned the incident could have serious consequences was completely unacceptable in a statement released by Pakistan's foreign office spokesperson in the early hours on Wednesday. On Monday, the IRGC, that would be the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, attacked targets in both Iraq and Syria. So right now, Iranian proxies are hitting they're, they're now affecting the following countries and areas. Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, northern Israel, southern Israel, the Gaza Strip, the Red Sea, and Pakistan. That's all like right now. I'm not talking about over the course of the last three years. I'm talking about like in the last three days. Okay, well, it, does that seem like a successful containment policy to you? Or might it be that the United States should say to Israel, do what you have to do against Hamas, and that the United States we have F-22s and F-35s, guys. You might want to actually devastate the ability of the Houthis to, you know, do what they are doing in the Red Sea. We might want to make clear to Hezbollah, the West, that if you guys get too, a little bit too much on the northern border of Israel, that we will allow Israel to do what it needs to do on the northern border as well. Again, the, the threat of force is what keeps people in line in the Middle East. The fact that this administration continues to try to play this middle game is so stupid. It's so idiotic. And it's predicated on, again, false notions of the centrality of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You may have noticed that in that whole disquisition that I just gave with regard to Iran, there are a bunch of countries that have literally nothing to do with the Palestinians. You're talking about the Red Sea. You're talking about Iraq and Syria. And you're talking about Pakistan. Do any of those places have to do particularly with Israel and the Palestinians? The answer, of course, is no. But for a long time in foreign policy circles, there has been this idiotic notion that central to all conflict in the Middle East is the Israeli-Palestinian issue, as though if Israel and the Palestinians came to some sort of agreement, Iran would calm down and everything would be all better. That, of course, is a lie. It is not true, but that is what Jake Sullivan is now preaching. I mean, here, here we go. Jake's, I mean, guys, here's how dumb Jake Sullivan is and bad at his job. Jake Sullivan literally had a piece in Foreign Affairs magazine. It was written before October 7th, and it came out the week after. And in the print edition, it suggested that Gaza had never been more peaceful. That's how bad Jake Sullivan is at his job. And this is the guy who's now designing Middle East policy. So you wonder why Donald Trump has a shot even against the rigors to be? The answer is because if you're bad enough at your job, it turns out the American people don't like it very much. So, so what you're saying is that the follow-up of the Abraham Accords was to bring in uh, if we were to bring in Saudi Arabia and that it would have been also uh, the basis for that would have to be a political solution um, also where Israel uh, would have to move on a two-state solution. Yes, in fact, when President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke in the weeks and months leading up to October 7th, uh, this was a, a key topic of discussion. How, where do the Palestinians fit into a broader vision for Israel's integration into the region and normalization with Arab states. The basic recipe, which is peace between Israel and its Arab neighbors, uh, a two-state solution with Israel security guaranteed, these pieces are not, um, you know, in a way, operating in completely separate spheres. They are linked and connected. They were before October 7th. They remain linked today. And there's something that we're going to have to continue to work on. Again, the very fact that Jake Sullivan is suggesting that if Israel had somehow made more concessions to the Palestinians, that, for example, October 7th never would have happened and peace would have broken out in the Middle East is totally insane. It's totally insane. I mean, first of all, it's totally insane that we're even having a conversation in the aftermath of the largest murder, mass murder of Jews since the Holocaust. 
about making concessions to the governments that support the mass murderers. That's totally insane. But again, the entire foreign policy of this administration is totally insane. And meanwhile, again, in the middle of all of this talk about concessions that the West can somehow make or how much care the U.S. has to take with the Houthis, in the middle of all this, we now have more and more reports that are emerging from Israel, from the people who are held hostage by Hamas, and they are just as awful as you thought they would be. There's a piece over at Barry Weiss's Free Press by a young woman named Agam Goldstein Almag. She's 17 years old. She watched Hamas murder her father and her sister in front of her eyes. And she explains what exactly happened. She said, I was with my mother, my protector, who did everything she could to keep me alive while we were in Hamas's captivity. Together with my two young brothers, aged nine and 11, the four of us had been taken from our home in Kibbutz Kfar Aza on the morning of October 7th, but not before terrorists shot my father and out point blank and afterward went my older sister, Yam, the bullet tearing through her face. Their blood spattered everywhere. We stepped over my father's dying body as the terrorists screamed at us, took us out of our home and drove us into Gaza. I never got to say goodbye. Any hopes we had they were still alive were dashed when we heard over the radio they had been murdered at some point during our captivity. We were moved a lot during our time in confinement, transferred through a series of homes, apartments, tunnels, even a mosque in Gaza. Remember, though, guys, it's, it's super easy to tell the terrorists from the civilians in Gaza, especially when they're holding the actual hostages among civilians. Our captors were cruel. During our captivity, they told us they would be back to our kibbutz. The fear was paralyzing. It overtook me. I remember saying to my mom when we entered the city, they're going to torture me. They're going to rape me. It was in the tunnels. I met other young women. Most of them were just a year or so older than my 17 years. Some still had bloody gunshot wounds that had been left untreated in makeshift bandages. One had a dismembered limb. I heard from them accounts of terrifying and grotesque sexual abuse, often at gunpoint. They told me that when they were sad they, and cried, their captors took advantage of their helplessness even more, stroking and caressing them and then shoving and grabbing intimate parts of their bodies. My mother, Chen, hugged them. They told us they hadn't heard the word Ima in so long. They ate for their own mothers. My mom later told me she felt like they were all her daughters having just lost one of her daughters herself. These young women were scared and they feared for their lives. They begged us to meet with their families if we were released. Tell them you saw us, they said, but don't tell them everything. Save their souls from the ghastly details. They pled with us to continue to fight for them to make sure they come home. They told me that more than 50 days ago. She says, I don't know if the women I left in the tunnels are still together. As I write these words, I can see the look in their eyes. What more have they endured? Are they still being abused? Are they still alive? She's 17 years old, this young woman. And the Biden administration is already putting pressure on the Israelis to stop their operation while these hostages are still being held. All in the name of supposedly, what, getting Iran to calm down? Getting Iran is not going to calm down. Signs of weakness are taken as signs of weakness. That's how it works. Meanwhile, Joe Biden is now calling people to the White House in an attempt to bridge gaps over Ukrainian aid. According to Politico, President Biden has now invited congressional leaders to the White House for a meeting on Wednesday to discuss ongoing negotiations over a national security spending bill to aid Ukraine and other priorities, according to three people familiar with the request. Senate negotiators have spent months discussing a potential bipartisan agreement to add new border and immigration policy restrictions to Biden's supplemental request for $100 billion for Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, and border security. Those negotiations have yet to produce a deal. Apparently, the attendees will include Senate Majority Leader Schumer, Senate Minority Leader McConnell, Speaker Mike Johnson, and House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries. Key committee leaders, including those head of the appropriations committees, are also expected to attend, according to two people. That presumably is going to be for show because obviously Joe Biden is in no particular shape to lead negotiations, nor has he taken a strong stand against the radicals in his own party and said that they ought to, for example, cave on some of the border provisions in order to assure the foreign aid that Joe Biden so desperately wants. All righty, folks, coming up, we are going to jump into the mailbag, so stick around. If you're not a member, become a member. Use Coach Shapiro at checkout for two months free on all annual plans. Click that link in the description and join us.